Hey everyone, it's Alex Ball with another episode of the No-Till Mark Garden Podcast. I'm really excited to share a conversation with you all from Adam of Country Valley Farm in Ann Arbor, Michigan. In the interview, we get to building new no-till beds with deep wood chips, and all pressure on the farm, the realize of farm with a full-time job, and put some garlic for the wholesale market. So without further ado, let's get to the talk with Adam for our Country Valley Farm. <laughs> Today's episode of the No-Till Market Garden Podcast is brought to you by Tilth Soil. This Cleveland, Ohio-based company is producing some of the highest quality potting mixes out there. One of the biggest lessons I learned in farming is the importance of good seed starting mixes, and that's why I included Tilth Soil in my book and have been using their seed starting mix, Sprout, on my farm since 2020. Tilth Soil produces potting mixes approved for use in organic operations like our own. Their living soil is made with fully composted food waste they collect and process themselves. Whether you need a cubic yard super sack once a year or ongoing deliveries for your year-round operation, Tilth has you covered. The team at Tilth can help with shipping, coordination, and provide ongoing support throughout the growing season. To learn more, visit www.tilthsoil.com. That's tilthsoil.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Orisha. Orisha is a greenhouse automation company whose mission is to make agriculture more ecological and productive through advanced technology. Orisha automates all temperature, humidity, and irrigation management systems. Their products are designed to be instinctive, easy to install, and wireless, and their remote management application allows growers to save time. In addition, the integration of AI in their programs offers more precision and better control over the various factors influencing the environment inside your greenhouse. Last thing, Orisha wants to help market gardeners optimize their yields. Automating allows a better quality of life, can save several weeks of labor costs, and saves nearly 20% in energy costs. Listeners can use the promo code no till grower. That's three words, no till grower, to get 15% off your order. Check them out at orisha.io. That's O R I S H A dot I O. All right, enjoy the show. I'm super excited to be here with Adam from Country Valley uh, in Ann Arbor. Uh, Adam, thank you so much for being uh, on the show with us. Yeah, it's an honor to be here. Thanks for having me, Alex. Oh, anytime. So just to let folks know uh, what you're up to, uh, where are you located, uh, how large is your farm, how much of that is cultivation, uh, kind of the basic you know, rundown of, your, of, your, of, your, uh, of where you're at. Right on. So our farm is Country Valley Farm. We are on the northeast edge of Ann Arbor. We're kind of between the village of Dixboro and uh, Plymouth. Um, total land that we own here is only 1.8 acres. Um, we're basically converting a lot of grass over to uh, production areas. Right now, we probably have a little bit over an acre in production um, with the goal of, of literally like, even in some places where it's not ideal to have like a standard field, we're converting those areas over to like culinary herbs and um, putting in things like that. So something you're really kind of squeezing in and getting getting the most out of all the space you have out there. Yeah, 100%. Oh, cool. So how long uh, have you been at this property for and how long have you been farming for in general? So we bought this property this month, makes five years since we bought the property. So we bought it, you know, the the end of November in 2017. And so there wasn't, it was too late to get anything in at that point. So, you know, spring of 2018 is when we started farming here. And um, I've been involved in organic farming about 32 years or so um, on various levels. My first experience was just helping someone else on their farm. I did a little bit of migrant farm work. Um, and then, uh, worked in uh, supply chain stuff where I was, you know, not farming at some points and, but working with farmers and, um, I had another farm that was in Chelsea, Michigan, um, for almost five years. And that now was, I guess that would go back probably about 12 years ago is when I left there about 11 or 12 years ago is when I left that. So I've had some gaps, but, um, fully focused on it uh, the whole time in some way or another. 
wow, so it sounds like a lot of like applicable skills, not only just operating the business, but like you know, from top down distribution to production kind of uh, 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 kind of lived experiences in agriculture. Yeah, it's a it's a labor of love. Yeah, totally. I, I feel a lot of people who do this, you know, we're here just not only for the money, really, we're here because we love it. Uh, you know, it's not a, it's not something we do because it's going to make us millionaires. It's something we do because, man, we can't stay anything else besides being out in the field. That's it. That's it. And if I do get to be a millionaire from it, that would be nice too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, if I make two million, I'll, I'll share one with you. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, so you said you've been there about five years at your at your current location. So, do do you live on property as well, or just is this a pro, uh, separate farm space? I live right here and that's part of the niceness about it is, you know, I can be outside adjusting an irrigation or, you know, within a minute or two and, you know, work till I'm exhausted <laughs> and then just go right inside and get something to eat and drink and refresh and go back out and stuff like that. Oh, perfect. Yeah. So you can totally, yeah, that's, that's, that's nice. So beside yourself, uh, who else works on the farm? Do you hire in labor? How does it work on uh, at your place right now? Well, I have three daughters and a son-in-law that they help uh, with various things at various times. I haven't really hired in labor. Um, I have a couple friends that help now and then with certain tasks. And then my daughters have brought in help mainly when we're doing uh, huge projects. So garlic planting, garlic harvest, onion planting, uh, stuff like that will kind of bring in a handful of folks and that, that helps kind of give some momentum to get those big tasks done. So it's not like it's a real community effort for those big work days. Yeah. Yeah. And we enjoy it. And there's something to be said for the upliftment of the positive energy of the young folks and they get the experience <laughs> and the whole time I'll be uh, just rattling off random organic <laughs> facts, you know, and yeah. uh, culinary tips and stuff <laughs> like that. Yeah, and it's yeah. I, I bet for all their friends, you're like you're, you're the fun dad, like you're the quirky guy, the quirky farmers out there. Like, yeah, come on out, we'll plant potatoes, and we'll share some wisdom. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, <laughs> nice. So uh, you said so you're in the farm full time. Uh, do you do any other work uh, outside of the farm season, or is the farm your your full time thing? Yeah, so I do work. I do work on the farm full time, but I also have a full time day job. So. I kind of work Monday through Friday, like 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. I work from home. I work for a nonprofit organic certifier. And, you know, so that also is nice. When four o'clock comes, most of the time, I can immediately change clothes, go outside and and start working, which, as you know, um, you know, when you're doing physical labor, to put in four or five hours of like hardcore focused work, that might not be considered an eight hour day, but from a physical perspective, that's actually a lot. Um, so the timing works out and now and then I'll use vacation time around, you know, like key, uh, like I took a week off recently from the day job just to focus on fall chores and stuff like that. It sounds like you found a really good job that complements your, your, your farm, your farm job as well. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Cool. So, uh, Based on, you know, you're, you, you know, you're saying it's 4 p.m. hitting the fields. What percentage of your day do you think go or of your overall time you think goes between, you know, field labor, you know, delivery, marketing, bookkeeping? How do you break down your, your work schedule? Well, I'm trying to get better at it. And so um, we do one farmer's market a week. We're done for the season with market, but we do Saturdays at Eastern Market in Detroit. Um, Sundays is CSA deliveries and CSA pickup. Um, and so like, uh, in terms of wholesale accounts, sometimes I'll deliver them on Sunday with the, with the CSA deliveries. Sometimes I'll just randomly do them various evenings or whatever. Um, yeah. And sometimes you're really rushing you know, and you're really trying to squeeze a lot in and, you know, there are certain, there are certain times a year where you're working outside until it's absolutely dark. And then when you can't see in the field. And so, you know, sometimes I'm like, sometimes I'll be harvesting a lot of stuff and I'm just harvesting and bringing it in, bringing it in, bringing it in. And then when it gets too dark to see, then I turn on 
the uh, lights, the outdoor lights, and then I'm washing and bunching and packing and sorting till midnight, um, stuff like that. So yeah, yeah, kind of that solid grind. You gotta take advantage of every every uh, hour of light you have. Yeah, and like my my main thing is stay hydrated and stay fed. I you know I eat a lot of peanut butter. Um, I drink a lot of coconut water. Um, I drink a lot of black tea. I drink a lot of yeah. soy milk. You know, um, I eat a lot of fruit, and I really feel like you know I might not. There's times a year where you are not getting enough sleep. It's just that's the, you are not. You're beyond exhausted, but the drive to get the work done really you can't sleep, and um, and then you sleep in the winter a little bit. Yeah. I find that I always end up getting sick like the last week of the season. I, I, I'll do my last CSA and if I, if my body kind of then finally unravels and says, now you can relax. And I always like collapse and I feel like I get really like down for a few days. My body has to like recover from, you know, eight months of just solid running and running and running. Uh, it's it, that winter, winter recovery time is so essential. Yes. Same thing. Same thing here. And you're like, well, I'm thankful I made it to the end, but now my body's like, well, it's some down, you know, forced downtime a little bit. Yeah. 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 And I, I don't know if maybe it's still at the long summer days. There's something about that. I mean, like, man, I gotta get some work done. I gotta get this. I gotta take care of business. But by the time we get, we we're it did like November and it's dark at 8 a.m. I'm like, eh, I think I can just stay inside for, for a few hours. I'll wait a little bit. Yeah. Oh yeah. There's definitely the waiting a little bit. I mean, you, you know, you, sometimes you go out too early when it's too cold and that chill gets into you. And, um, I mean, it's, you don't really move at the right speed once you get that cold anyways. Yeah. Especially be in Michigan, you know, we, we get, it's like in January when it's like, you know, 15, 17 degrees out there and that wind's whipping, you, you know, I'll wait until 11, 12 o'clock just till the sun comes up enough to not just, so you're not, you're not destroyed by the cold. Uh, I feel like things are so much harder to do in the winter. You know, everything takes twice as long. I agree. Yeah. So you were mentioning earlier, you know, you do some CSA, some markets. Uh, so do you do any uh, wholesale restaurants as well on top of that? Yep. I have a couple um, specialty uh, produce and uh, grocery stores that buy select items from me. And then I have a couple chefs that buy things from me. Um, and then we also purvey items to um other farms um and stuff like that yeah i really try to my goal is as much as possible what we plant to harvest and as much as possible what we harvest to find a good home for and oftentimes the price is below what maybe other small farmers would be willing to accept for those items but it fits our model and we're still trying to grow the business and build our brand yeah, totally. It, it takes time to build that name up and to get to a point where you think you can get the price that you really, what the product's worth. It takes, it takes definitely yeah. time building that up. So uh, for those who don't know, uh, you said earlier you, sh you uh, sell at Eastern Market in Detroit. Uh, explain Eastern Market to people uh, outside the state. I mean, it's an awesome place. So I think it's, I think it's maybe the oldest open air market in the country. Um, there are sheds there, there, so you have a roof over you, uh, you don't necessarily have walls. Some of the sheds kind of have walls and some don't, um, I think on a, on a Saturday, I think they average about 10,000 people coming through. I mean, it is extremely busy. <laughs> There's hundreds of vendors. They have everything from really small growers like smaller than us to very large established growers you have people who are selling product that they didn't grow that's allowed um and and supposedly clarified you know so there's people selling stuff from other countries stuff from other states there's people that make food and sell it there's people that make products and sell it and um you get a wonderful diverse uh community of customers that come through there and that's pretty exciting and uh nice to be able to interact with and it kind of runs from like 6 a.m until 4 p.m but most farmers like to leave around one or two 
I used to sell there when I first started and it's an organized madhouse. It's, it's insanely cool. It's, if you're, if I'm, if you go online, check out photos of it. It's like a huge goth that like steel and brick building. It's, it's, it's something to see. Uh, so it's definitely a fun time. So do you go there? What's the seasonality uh, that you're heading out to the market for? Well, we finally got approved to go there this year. So this was our first year there. We started in July and we just finished going recently because uh, I needed the time to focus on farm chores on Saturdays because it's getting dark so early and stuff. But our long-term goal is to be there year round. That's year round. Yeah. We're trying to build up to that and have enough storage crops. And um, we also uh, bring produce from a select other local organic farms. So for example, we were bringing apples there from Almar Orchard. Almar's up in Flushing, which is near Flint. They're about an hour from us. Uh, they've been certified organic for decades. They've been growing apples in that family in that spot since 1850. And so we, I looked around, there was no one else selling any organic fruit there. So I was like, well, I want the organic fruit for my CSA. Let me try it at the market. And it seemed to be well received. Do you, uh, I, like, I, I always wondered if uh, with all those farms there, you know, do people, do you sell out when you go there? Or is that, or is it kind of like we bring what we hand to take glass off home? How, how, how the sales there? You sell out of some things some days. Gotcha. I do. See, I do see there are farmers that have a pretty near sellout model. I also see there's folks that in the end, they just really drop the price on everything. Um, you know, somebody will be selling a basket of tomatoes for $5 all day. It gets to the end. They're, they're saying dollar basket, dollar basket. So I have seen that model. I don't really do that. Um, we just bring a million different things. And so it's near impossible. I will do things when it's getting towards the end and I want to pack up or if I am packing up where certain items, leafy greens, if I have a ton of tomatoes and it's like, what am I going to do with all these tomatoes <laughs> where I'll start hooking people up real nice at the end? Um, you know, Hey, somebody comes up, they want to buy a bunch of kale and a bunch of collards. And I might say, Hey, if I give you a couple of extra bunches, will you eat them? Yeah. You know, and yeah. if they say yes, then I just give them that. Yeah. That's awesome. So speaking, you, you talked about a few crops you're producing. What are your, your main crops you're growing? What are you bringing to market? What kind of your uh, cross-section things you produce? So our main crop would be garlic. Garlic is our number one crop. Um, then we do, we started getting pretty big and big for us. And the onions, yeah. um, potatoes are nice. We have a lot of animal pressure here. And so I need to be selective. Uh, we like to grow a bunch of greens. I did really good with lettuce. Uh, right now, I still have a lot of fall crops. We've done string beans and stuff like variety specialty beans before. Um, basically, like, I can't help myself with the seed catalog. <laughs> and, uh, like, we just like to eat all the veggies. And so we, we, we do a lot of stuff. But I really, I'd say the bulk of what we do is garlic potatoes, onions. I have a good amount of space that I devoted to asparagus and we kind of interplanted some perennial herbs. And I'm hoping next year we'll start really harvesting off the asparagus. Is, is that asparagus mainly for the CSA? Well, we'll see how it goes. Okay. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> we planted um, about a thousand crowns two years in a row. So the first year I planted um, Purple Passion. And then the next year I planted uh, Millennium, which is a green uh, one that's kind of gaining popularity in, in this area in Ontario. How do you, um, how do you manage the weeds in those perennial uh, asparagus crops? Yeah, we, we pull weeds ridiculously. <laughs> There's occasions in certain areas, if I can run a lawnmower through, I will. We use a lot of wood chips on our farm. I'm a, a dedicated dump spot for one of the tree surfaces. And um, we, we've spread literally, I don't know, probably over a thousand yards of wood chips over the last wow. how many years. You know, the average load we get 
is probably 12 to 20 yards, depending on which truck they dump. So, yeah, I'd say we, I think we've passed a thousand yards of wood chips, but the grass is the worst weed we have. Um, and then thistles are not fun. <laughs> um, but in the beginning, I spread the wood chips. I didn't spread it thick enough because I didn't fully understand how strong these weeds were. And so we spread a lot of wood chips for uh, the first year. And then uh, the next thing you know, the grass came right back through. Oh, That's, no. I know that helped the soil structure, but it didn't help. So basically, I dump the, I, I, I have one of those big double whammy Rubbermaid brand wheelbarrows with the nice big tires. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I dump it in, in I dump it in, and I do not spread it like okay so it'll start really thick and then it'll reduce over time and then very few weeds will come through that but what will happen is weed seeds will blow so mm. even though you smothered now the weed seeds will blow and so but then it's it's much more manageable um and we also have taken the silage tarping i should have done that in the beginning and I just didn't have the awareness to do it. So now, like, for example, I have an area that used to be lawn in the back of the house that we silage tarp this spring. And next spring, part of it will become onions and the other part will stay covered in silage tarp. And then in the fall, that'll go to garlic. Um, yeah, so I I pull hand, I hand weed and I, I uh, like to hoe a lot i've gotten really good with the hoe and um we buy we buy a fair amount of uh compost um and have used that but i also noticed with the compost we're getting a lot of annual weeds come in the compost mm. sometimes um velvet. it's coming from the compost supplier with the weeds already in them yeah velvet leaf lamb's quarters purse lane but the thing is those weeds are not really it can seem like a lot, but they're not really that bad. The worst weed is the thistle and the grass. Gotcha. And that thistle, I'm guessing, it's it, it's it travel it travel it's, it's like a taproot that travels right underground. Is that how yeah, it works? Yeah, yeah. So you think you got the taproot, but if there's any little smidgen of it left, it's coming back. Coming right back. So is that something I, I, I I've never really I mean, a little bit in the farm, but not not really much. Uh, is that something that if you till it in, it then spreads even more? We, it's like that. When we first got here, we tilled, and then I was like, "This is ridiculous." And so <laughs> we don't use the tiller. We haven't used the tiller for years. Um, it didn't seem to help, and so like my, I feel like. I feel like the amount of time it takes to spread the wood chips is the best use of time. And that eventually I don't expect we'll be 100% weed free and I'm not actually philosophically opposed to some weeds. I just don't want them. I don't want them to rule my life and I don't want them in beds where it negatively impacts the crop. Um, but I, I, there is, there's, there's, I think there's a time and a place where maybe what the weeds are doing is they are also sourcing minerals and nutrients in the soil from below, bringing it up. And then when I pull those weeds and basically I, I have a berm at the end of one field where all weeds get dumped. And I'm trying to think of what I'm going to plant in that berm, because I think that's like going to that. be a pretty fat uh, nutrient dense area. I, I like that idea. I like that mindset of, you know, the, they're, they're taking our nutrients, but then we're going to compost and break them down and we don't, we don't reclaim that nutrients back in the long term. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there a lot of times we focus on NPK and calcium and stuff, but the micronutrients are critical. And I mean, that's part of the health of the food, too, is having that diversity of nutrition. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I want to get back to one thing. You said so. You're talking about spreading down this uh, this mulch, you know, a foot and a half or so, two feet, sounding thick. Uh, is that between beds? Is that around pathways? Where are you putting this compost? So just everywhere. This wood chips is it's everywhere in the property. So basically, it's everywhere. But uh, mainly, what I'm doing now is 
once an area is pretty established and like I've put all those wood chips and they've kind of broken down, then I'm only really doing them on the pathways. And I do take a landscape rake and I'm not really spreading it so they're thinner, but I spread it so it's even and to catch the little edges because when you use a wheelbarrow, your pile is going to have some rounding, you know? Yeah. Um, and so there are times where I'll, um, like with the garlic field last year, I was like, huh, feel like the beds are going to get weedy. So I took some of what I had put in the walkways and kind of raked it over the, where the garlic was planted. Interesting. So you had like the mulch sitting there kind of like a ready, ready to deploy mulch whenever you really needed it uh, on the bed. Yeah. Yeah. And the, you know, with wood chips, they rob nitrogen when they break down, they, they take the nitrogen from the soil to break down the carbon in the wood chip. Um, so, you know, you need to be mindful of that. And so I, <clears throat> I buy a heat treated poultry pellet. Um, and that's my primary uh, fertility that I use. I also use an organic feather meal. I use organic kelp meal and stuff like that. So you need to be mindful. It went the very first year that I used wood chips. I didn't realize, I knew it was going to happen, but I didn't f- use enough fertility and, and it didn't work. Those crops failed or performed very poorly. So you're saying that for the very first season, there wasn't enough nitrogen or whatever to make up for the loan that was pulled from the wood chips. Absolutely. And then when the wood chips break down, then the nit- they do put nitrogen back. But So like I'm really loving these heat-treated poultry pellets that I get from Morgan Composting. That's, that's my number one in terms of tonnage of inputs that I use. Today's episode is brought to you by Real Organic Project. Does your farm deserve to be recognized for all the hard work done on behalf of the environment and your community? Real Organic Project is an add-on certification that partners with 1,000 plus certified organic farms across North America, including my own farm, Rough Draft Farmstead. Available at no cost to farmers and with minimal time commitment, it is a great way to differentiate your farm from mass-marketed corporate organic where hydroponic production and animal confinement are still commonplace. Real Organic Project is a whole farm certification program to distinguish crops grown in healthy soils and livestock raised humanely on pasture. As a farmer-led movement, we know many hands make for quick work. I hope you will lend yours by signing up for Real Organic Project certification today. Visit realorganicproject.org slash no-till to apply. That's realorganicproject.org slash no-till to apply. Today's episode is also brought to you by Rimmel Greenhouses. Whether it's tomatoes to market, flowers in the spring, or your family's harvest, growing in a greenhouse protected from the weather provides the right environment that you need for a harvest that you can count on. Rimmel Greenhouses are designed for durability and offer the quality that you need to grow productively year-round. Visit RimmelGreenhouses.com to get a quote today. If I may editorialize for a second, I own a Rimmel tunnel. I love it. We built it ourselves, and I really appreciated the quality of the tunnel as well as the customer service we received in the process. So make sure to check them out. All right, back to the show. So let me ask you uh, about your, your your process of prepping these beds. So uh, they're talking about the deep wood chip uh, mulch around them. And then are you just composting the beds and fertilizing directly? Are you uh, forking? Kind of take me through your, 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 your bed prep process. I hoe for rows. That's okay. Yeah. So I'll come through and like when I'm gonna, when the bed is brand new, if I'm in a, an area I haven't planted before, that bed is going to get covered with the wood chips. That bed will get covered with, and I am going to plant in to those wood chips. Now the bed is going to get covered with wood chips. And then I'm going to take a hoe and I'm going to make furrows in the bed. Most of my beds are two or three rows per bed. And then I'm going to take the uh, compost. And I used to buy organic peat moss, but then the price, like there was a period of time where the organic peat moss is pretty reasonable and and pretty available. Uh, But then the price went way up. And so I'm kind of not using so much of the organic peat moss anymore. I'm just using the compost. But I then the compost, then I'll come along with my wheelbarrow and my shovel and I'm throwing the compost into now the furrows that I've made. And um, 
And that's enough for the young plants or the seeds, whether I'm direct seeding or transplanting, that's enough for them to be happy. And then those roots go right into those wood chips and, um, and the wood chips start breaking down. And, and so then once that bed's established, then in future years, if I'm not re wood chipping it to that extreme, I'll just come through and pull the weeds and I just take my hoe. I'll kind of take like a standard, like square type of hoe and, and basically bust up the soil that way. And then I like to use one of these, I think it's called a Warren hoe. It's kind of like a, a triangle shape. That's my, that's my, that's my tool of choice. And then I'll. What's it, what's it called again? What, what kind of hoe? Warren. I think it's called a Warren hoe. Yeah. And so I'll take, I'll take that to like make the actual furrows that I'm going to plant into. And, um, and then I just plant right into it like that. And um, depending on the crop, sometimes I'm going to amend it before planting. Sometimes I side dress. I don't use any raw manure, so I don't have a pre-harvest interval concern. Um, and so depending on the crop, like with some fall crops that I had planted in what was the garlic field, um, I was things got away from me. And so some of the beds, I did it exactly as planned and some it didn't go exactly as planned. <laughs> and then I was like, well, I'm going to wait until the, the, the crops up and I see my stand. And I'm just going to carefully side dress, uh, and and it's fine. Wow, that's super interesting. So you're taking uh, the wood chips and putting the furrows in there. How how much uh, wood chips do you say is there from the bottom of the furrow to the soil layer? Six to twelve inches at least. Inter okay, so you have like a let's say six, six, six to twelve inches of compost in a furrow, and then. Six to twelve inches of wood chips, and then soil on on the bottom of that. Maybe maybe three to six inches of compost in the furrow, and then below the bottom of that furrow, maybe there's six to twelve inches of wood chips. Wow, how long? Ha like, will those wood chips underneath the furrow be gone by the end of the season? Well, they they turn. They you can see when they change color, and then what they become. Yeah, eventually you won't. Eventually, there'll be maybe a few big chunks that you'll still notice, but before you know it, it, you won't know that that was wood chips if you didn't know that's what was there. Okay. So, I, I'm, I'm guessing that if you're going to be direct seeding, you'd be direct seeding into a more developed, more aged bed that was a little more broken down, or are you seeding into those furrows I'll as well? Into those furrows. I'll, I mean, yeah, it's, you, get a, you usually perform better when you're not in that first year bed. Um, but the way my rotation is and my limited space, we do what we do. And what I've noticed, although people think of wood chips as retaining moisture, because they do, they don't in the beginning. They, okay. they, will, they will draw your moisture like a sponge. And so if I'm in new beds, I just know I need to irrigate more often. You just adjust your irrigation schedule based on the age of the bed. Yeah, and you'll know. You can smell it. You can smell the dryness in, in the field when it's too dry. Wow. So these uh so you know a lot of wood chips coming in. Um does are you picky on on the type of wood it is, or is it whatever that comes we're taking and putting down? I tell them no black walnut, please. I don't want any black walnut. And I don't want anything that came from like a treated area because we're certified organic. And so basically like one, one time at the beginning of this season, they dropped a load during the day. And then I was uh, getting ready right after, you know, my day job to go out there and spread it. And the guy called me from the tree service. He's like, you know what? I, I just dropped you black walnut. Um, mm. And I said, well, I'm not going to use that one for a while. And then later on, I'll use that on the outside edge of a field where I'm not going to plant, but I don't want the grass like moving in. Makes total sense. Yeah. It's just it's like a, a general mulch in a non-production area. Yeah. But to your question, like sometimes what gets delivered has a lot of leaves chopped up. Sometimes there's a lot of pine needles chopped up. Sometimes it's like really fancy looking nice wood chips that you know you might think of like for a landscaping application i just 
use them all. I also, because I get multiple loads, so I have these giant piles in a few areas. When I'm wheel, when I'm loading the wheelbarrow, I don't just load from one area. So one bed probably has wood chips from five to 15 different uh, deliveries. Gotcha. So you've got like a, a, a nice diversity of different types of, of wood chips coming in on, on the beds at one time. That's really interesting. That's super cool. So uh, bes- so you're, you're saying your main fertility is coming from that ch- chicken manure. How much are you putting down? Or I should maybe ask uh, the size of your beds and how much are you putting down of that chicken manure to uh, uh, for a season or for, per crop? Yeah, the beds, they're not all the exact same size, but most of them are about four feet wide and about 100 feet long. So I have some beds where it's almost 150 feet long and I have some where it's closer to 50 feet. But so basically for four by a hundred feet, I would use a 40 pound bag of the uh, poultry pellets. And that would be once or twice per year. I would apply that. Is that like a seven, five, three or something? Seven, five, two. I think it's a, um, I think the one, the heat treated one, I think is a four, three, two. Okay. Gotcha. So a 40 pound bag for the hundred foot row. Yeah. And you get 8% calcium in that. Um, and then I do, I use azomite, the organic azomite, um, for trace minerals. I, um, I use a sunflower K ash, uh, which I, uh, that's pretty high in, um, in your potassium and your potash, um, and I use Tennessee brown rock phosphate. I use the, the Neptune's Harvest kelp meal very sparingly because it's very expensive. But I, I especially like to use that on greens and lettuce. Um, I was using an organic allowed uh, a Chilean nitrate, which is a 1502. Uh, if you're certified organic, you're allowed to use certain Chilean nitrates up to 20% of your nitrogen needs. But then I realized it wasn't helping my microbes in the soil. Um, and so I stopped using that a couple of years ago. And um, the feather meal is nice. It's a 1300. That's a little bit pricey also, but that works really good. So like the, the poultry pellets are really the key. Um, yeah, we've gotten some from Herb uh down the, you know, in, was in Grand Rapids or Ionia or where's that. Um, and as far as price goes, I don't know what a ton is right now, but two, three hundred bucks or so. Uh, how, how much are you paying for uh, paying for that? So I buy them. I don't buy them from Herb Brooks. I buy it from more. I buy most of my inputs from Morgan Composting because they are one stop shop and they'll deliver. Um, I feel like the 40 pound bag, I don't know, I think it's six or eight bucks. And then you got a couple bucks for the delivery, depending on you know, how the load comes. And I just feel like that's really great. I, I did early on take a dump truck load of composted uh, poultry manure, which wasn't heat treated. It was composted, which is still thermophilic, but um in terms of um, applying the nutrients, the bags are great. I like the bag because I cut a hole in the top of it. I hold it like a baby <laughs> and I walk along <laughs> and it goes quick. <laughs> yeah. And are you putting that uh, in the in the trench and then composting it or are you putting it on top of the bed before you wood chip it? Generally, it's going to go on top of wood chips. Oh, on top of the wood chips. Generally, it's going to go on top. Sometimes it'll get worked and generally it's going to go on top because my feeling is it's going to get watered in. Like, I know they say like with phosphorus that it doesn't move. You know, um, I was doing some research like in terms of my asparagus beds and they were, basically they say phosphorus doesn't move. It sits, but that might be true that it doesn't move in terms of chemically, but water Water moves things downward. Yeah, yeah. The, the water turns the gravity. Will, I think we'll push it and infuse it down into the wood chips and then break down at the soil. Yeah, and I just I also feel like you have most crops you have adventitious fibrous roots that are going to be near the soil surface, especially with the use of the wood chips because we have a lot of earthworm activity, 
And so I just feel like I'd rather, I don't want to put fertilizer so low that it's not, that the plant's not going to find it. And I, I just believe that at those deeper levels, that fertility is intact anyways. We live in Michigan. We have good fertility here. And so like once the roots get to a certain depth, that's they're in a happy place anyway. Yeah, that's, uh, have you, do you do any soil testing at all uh, to help, you know, dyed anything or is it kind of just, this, this, you run the system? I do very little, but I need to do it more often. Um, I did some kind of establish a baseline early on a couple of times. And then I didn't do it last year because I knew like, you know, there was a lot of wood chipping had happened in the last two years. And so like this spring, I will do it again. And um, I'm most excited to see the increases in organic matter because we kind of are on a, a sandy, the sandy loam, but it's very sandy. And so it'll be nice to see like the organic matter increases. Um, and I'm not super... I'm not really planning on adding synthetic micronutrients. I guess like if there was a real challenge, like with boron or something like that, maybe I would look into that, but that's why I like the azomite trace minerals. Um, yeah. And I, I've been following um, John Kempf of advancing eco agriculture in Ohio. And I listen to his talks over and over and over again and try to expand my knowledge. <laughs> I like that he's promoting a reduction in reliance on the macronutrients of the NPK and the calcium and really looking at plant health. I haven't done sap analysis and, you know, stuff like that, but that's the school of thought that I'm, I'm following. Super cool. That's uh, one thing I was, I was really wondering through all this, you mentioned a little bit earlier about, you know, you, you love the seed catalogs and I looked at your Instagram and seen some just beautiful beans and uh, just beautiful uh, different greens. Uh, who, who do you uh, get most of your seeds from? And is there anything like any varieties right now that you're really excited about for this next season? We mostly get our seeds from high mowing seed company. They're all organic. I love working with them. They have really quality seeds. Then after high mowing, I, I love Johnny's. They do good stuff through the decades. They've been there, you know, they've got cool tools. Um, I will, Johnny's would be kind of the next stop. And then third would be Seedway. I think they're in Pennsylvania. Seedway generally uh, provides for a lot of large growers, but they have an extensive, really extensive list. I get my transplants from Sinzori Farm. They're out towards Battle Creek in Soresco, Michigan. They're certified organic. They've been certified since the 80s. And that's the, I get all of my uh, transplants from them. They're all certified organic. They do an exceptional job. Some people say, oh, why don't you raise your own plugs? It's like, well, you know, you can't do everything at once. They charge a fair price. They do a good job, and they have a huge selection. Um, I buy my potatoes. Seed potatoes come from Sensori Farm or uh, New Sprout Farm, which is Sprout Mountain. So you said uh, the, 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 the transplant farm is a local farm to you. Uh, you know, just for just as a baseline, if if you want to do like a tray of cabbage, we're talking like 10, 15, 20 bucks. What's kind of the, no, the price range? No, it's more than like that. that. It's more than that. Um, it's a better price than ordering um, flats and getting them mailed. Mm, yeah. else it's it's a fair price um it's not free <laughs> and um most of the plants come in a, a tray of 128 some are 96 and very occasionally there's a 72 sometimes i want an oddball item that maybe he already put in a 48 or whatever but mostly it's 128 um yeah, we, so we do a lot of our own transplants, but every year I, I say, man, if we had a good local transplant farm, that could save us so much time. And, in, you know, really, it's, I like raising plants because it's fun for me, but at the same time, it's a huge burden on our operation. Not only is it the, the time and labor, but it's one of the larger power energy subs, you know, whether it's propane or electric, whatever you're heating that tunnel with. Uh, and if something goes wrong with that, now you're sitting there with a tunnel, with a freezing cold tunnel if you lose power. So it ends up, so many things can go wrong in that, let's say, four month period uh, where you need those eggplants to go in the ground. And if you don't, if they mess up, you don't have them. You're just don't have eggplant that season. 
Well, I'm happy to share the contact info with you, Alex. And I'm actually, you know, I'll go out there and pick up the flats certain times a year. And then certain times a year, he'll deliver them if he's coming this way. And so I'm happy to include you. I wouldn't do an upcharge, of course. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm happy to include you. And in general, I would say 99% of the time, the plants are exceptional. And, you know, I mean, it's farming, it's organics. So there's, it's not 100%, but I don't know anybody, I don't know anybody whose transplants do this well. And um, yeah, so we could talk about that later on and like, yeah, for sure. I, yeah. I think especially for those lawn season crops, those tomatoes, peppers, stuff like that. And it's like, you know, if if one thing goes wrong along that huge process, you know, there's so much work to be done once they make it into the ground. It's so much more work to think about, you know, the four months ahead of time before they make it there. It ends up being almost a year investment and so many things can go wrong, go wrong along, the time, along that timeline. It'd be nice to have like one thing be certain. Oh, yeah. I love it. I love it. And uh, like he built a germination chamber because, you know, for peppers you, and, yeah. and probably a few other crops, you know, peppers, they really want to be really warm, really warm when you're first popping seeds. And when those babies are first starting, he built a germination chamber so that like it's focused, you know, in terms of the amount of space and resources and I mean, his plants come very healthy. My goal is each week, the plants that I get, that they go in that week, I'm, I'm adamant that the concept of leaving them in the tray is not a good idea. Like when they're, when I pick them up or he delivers them, they are ready and, and I need to have the beds ready and those plants need to go in. And that, that's a, that's an important, um, that's like, I think it's important. I see some other folks. It's like, what do you, why do you have those trays there for all those weeks? Like that's a priority. And that, and I, I find, I find too, especially once you get root bound inside that, the small trays, a lot of times it can't break past that once you get in the field. Uh, I'll, I'll pull up like an old cabbage. I can see, Oh, this, this is a root bound transplant that it has been damaged because it spent time in the tray. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, I learned the hard way with that where, you know, you get it things get away from you and then you're like ah oh, okay i'll put it and then the same thing then later on you notice like that root ball stayed in that and like it's really important when you transplant to keep water on them like you want it you want it pretty wet for that first week and then for the next week as you start weaning them off a little bit you can't abandon them just you know just like a baby needs to eat all the time like these plants need they need the water and that's that's my key um yeah and i also like i don't have a transplanting machine i transplant by hand it with a trowel you know i i put the trowel in the ground to make the little spot i put the transplant in and so like what i'll do is i'll get the bed ready make the furrow and then i'll walk along with the tray in my hand and usually i take like a little stick or something that is perfect to kind of pop the some, yep. some things they come out of the tray easier than others and, and, and some plants certain varieties certain trays so a lot of times i could just grab the plant and just pop it right out maybe squeeze the bottom of it a little bit but like if if you notice that that thing is not just whooshing right out of there you don't want to be like dismantling it um so i'll I'll get them all out like and kind of walk along my furrow and and then uh, some things I'm pretty precision. So I'll have like a tape measure, a hundred foot tape measure or whatever. Out. And then like for garlic planting and stuff like that, we have yardsticks. Just bought a bunch of one dollar yardsticks <laughs> and we just walk along yeah. with that, you know. Well, oh, that's super cool. I, I, I once made this tool or took a, a zip tie and fold it in half. And then put tape at the bottom like a handle. So then, that, so the zip tie is kind of bulbous, and it'll pop through the hole at the bottom of the tray, uh, and, then, and then you push it out. Nice, yeah. So you know what yeah, I'm talking time. about, yeah. Yeah, I know exactly you're talking about. Yeah, I do all this. Yeah, I know exactly you're talking about. But yeah, it's, it's either that or a stick I can find the ground that fits <laughs> that fits in the hole, right? Yes, it's yes. worth it too. Uh, you had uh, you had alluded to a, a lot of damage on your uh, as far as animal damage at your property what's uh, what's going on there what's kind of the what's what's the, what's the major pest you got there deer woodchucks rabbits squirrels 
moles, <laughs> moles, field mice. You, you know, <laughs> around here, there's a lot of people that used to farm that those farms are going fallow and then being turned into subdivisions. We finally have, uh, there's finally a, a, a pair of coyotes that are in this area, but for many years there was, there was no predator and the animals just run freely. And, um, and so they like to eat stuff. So I actually, certain things I do them under the Agrabon row cover not because of temperature, but because that's my way of keeping the animals out. Because most of the animals don't, they're like, what the heck's going on over there? You know, when the fabric's all, yeah. Yep. Yeah. No, I do the same thing at my place for the, for them too. Like it's, it, it blows me away that, you know, it's all tapes on some level. They can cover up with the fabric and the groundhog will walk right past it, which is, it's yeah. so silly. But <laughs> And I know I've seen, I've seen you've been posting, you're dealing with these groundhogs. I mean, they're terrible. Sometimes yeah. in the daytime, I look on my front porch and there's a groundhog laying there sunning on my porch. <laughs> you know, and like, I did some parsley right out here and the groundhog's like, oh, I love the parsley. It's like, leave the parsley, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I found like, it's especially if, even if you move, if you remove one, another one will replace it almost immediately. They're, they move in a territory so fast. Yeah. There's a lot of them in this part of Michigan. Yeah. 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 We're pretty lucky where we're at the, usually we're, we're, in a, we're in a wet area. So usually in most seasons, the ground's too wet for them to burrow and to live. But this year has been just so darn dry that they can now burrow and they moved in overnight. We hadn't, we had, didn't have one for five years or for four years. And this year it dried out and we've had sits this season. That sucks. And they're terrible, right? Like, They'll come through. The amount of damage they can do in one night is um, extensive. It is. It, it, it extensive and like borderline depressive. Because like, especially with all that hard work. And I was just talking to uh, another farm, a flower farm, and they think they said five thousand dollars of damage. You know, in a small amount of time. And you know, we're talking farms our size, you know, quarter acre, acre farms, and to have that much loss or that much unplanned loss in your system is devastating. I find. It is. I had one bed that of lettuce that I had been harvesting from. So it wasn't a full bed and the row cover blew off. Oh, my cat wants attention. <laughs> and the, the row cover blew off and, and somebody deers, would, somebody came through and just ate these beautiful butter lettuces. And you know, they eat the middle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, it's almost like they go like, when voles will go and chew like, a little bite out of every turnip on a row. And you're like, why'd you come on now? Yes. <laughs> Can you just have yes. one whole one? Just one. Just one. <laughs> and they always eat the best, biggest one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I, that's how I feel. I don't know about you. Uh, this time of year, we have all these storage crops late into the fall. I'm walking by every day, just double checking. Just like, I, I know they've been fine so far, but like if I go there one day and like they're all, you know, been cored out, I'm going to be devastated. Yeah. They ate, I had some uh, cherry bell radishes and they ate a lot of those, but I had a lot. And so it was one of those instances where I'm just walking along harvesting, but they ate the bigger, better ones, <laughs> you know, and like, I've got a lot of purple top turnips out there that I've been kind of waiting on. And those are all come on Friday. I'm going to take them all. Well, I'm going to take all the ones that have decent uh, size roots. Yeah. Just because. We know it's about to get really cold, and so the animals are going to change their feeding habits again. Yeah, yeah. So uh, when you're you know, bringing all this crop in, uh, do, you, do you have a wash pack, a barn? How, how do you store all your product? Well, we have a, like a two-and-a-half-car garage that I've converted into a barn, and so we don't park in there. We just park in the drive, and it's got a concrete floor, which is nice with the drain. And so I have like a ton of different folding tables and I bought those 27 gallon uh, black totes with the uh, yellow lids. And I kind of use those for, um, for washing. I use a product called Sanidate 5.0 as a water additive because we're on a well. So the water's not chlorinated. So that's kind of my, oh. my simple little post harvest food safety program that I, you know, implemented and, um, 
We have a, we bought a garage fridge that we took all the shelves out and, you know, brand new and just dedicated that. Um, and that will hold, I could get about six bushels, like six, actually six, you know, those one and one ninth bushel boxes. I can get about yeah. six of those in there. And then, so I bought a bunch of water bottles and I bought a bunch of these jumbo, jumbo coolers. And so we do a process where I freeze these water bottles and product that I need to really like get the field heat out of. So I'll, I'll, if it's like a leafy thing, I'm going to wash it. The water is very cold because it's coming from the well. I'll, I'll wash it. Okay. Yeah. I have a bunch of um, like RPC type containers and similar type containers that are like the black plastic with the uh, holes. So, you know, they have airflow. So I'll wash stuff. I'll let it drip for a little bit and then I'll move it into the fridge to overnight to get the uh, field heat out of it. And then I'll move those into these giant coolers with uh, the frozen water bottles. And that's kind of my current system. I, I would love to have a walk-in cooler. We've actually looked at renting cooler space places and we did get a couple offers, but then it, the timing wasn't right. And um, just the way my system is, I'm just disciplined about harvesting and selling, harvesting and selling. Um, and then like, for example, potatoes, we harvested potatoes as we went for the last few months, left them in the ground and just harvested weekly. And then recently harvested out all the potatoes because the garlic is going where the potatoes were. But now this time of year, those potatoes are fine. Um, I dry the, I dry the garlic in my garage. that's now a barn. And then we have a root cellar. Um, that's probably, mm, that's probably a good 10, 12 feet down and it's, uh, it's cinder block. And so that's kind of like, I'll, I'll dry the garlic for two to three weeks at ground level and then move everything down into the root cellar. For storage. Was that root cellar on property and you got there? Did you build that? It was here. Oh, nice. Was that yeah. a perk of the place when you when you when you were looking when you were, when you were shopping around? Yeah, I was like, this is very weird and very beneficial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, it seems like almost set up for a market gardener to move in here to yeah. to use this. Yeah, that, that's super cool. Uh, so maybe we'll, we'll wrap up. We have uh, wasn't asked you a little bit about your like your farm finances and kind of how you see your farm. Um, so what are some of your long-term like, financial and also like business goals uh, for your business? Yeah. So financially, I would like that we, you know, I had mentioned it before that I fully utilize my space to get as many plantings and crops per year in rotation that I'm harvesting what I'm planting, that I'm selling what I'm harvesting. I'm learning that there's crops that I grow that take a ton of work and they don't make much money. <laughs> you, you do the math, you're like, okay, that was $3 an hour. If I'm lucky, that that's not gonna work. And then there's other crops where you get good sell through, you can make good amount of money off the bed. It's not just about the money, but the rotation is going to solve for the other things. I'm, I'm very into um, annual and perennial herbs. There's a lot of things that I'll let flower and go to seed and place. So we create that. So, but to produce what as much as I can off this spot, build up my um, CSA and then connect with um other local organic farms to expand my csa i really i like the csa model we added home delivery and people really like that i like that model you know michigan has 10 michigan has 10 million people or so living here so realistically i don't see why i can't have a thousand csa members or more um, we're strategically doing advertising in very small areas and like we're trying to, I try to do right by my CSA members and make it be the way I would want it to be if I was a CSA member. And I'm just hoping that word of mouth things will grow 
and that will just continue to gain more CSA members. For some people, they set a, a cap. I don't really, I'm not that kind of a thinker. And, you know, everybody has to eat. There's a lot of people that live around here. And so my goal is to try to provide uh, good food for as many folks as I can. That's fantastic. And I, I, I feel like I've seen a lot of CSAs, our scale, moving more towards that model of, you know, I'm going to grow the core crops I'm really, really good at. And then I'm going to source to others from uh, some of these other amazing growers in the area to really fill out the CSA. Uh, I don't know about you, but like the idea of growing every single thing isn't really scalable, uh, especially on a small scale. Yeah, it's not scalable. And, you know, I'm not saying like I wouldn't love to move into a larger farm space and financially, potentially that can happen. Really, labor is a challenge. Hmm. And that that's not going to go away. It, it's 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 partially a challenge because the way the economy is. It's partially a challenge because the way people want food prices to be low. And so that impacts your ability to pay people. It's partially a challenge because farm work is really hard. Yeah. And and to try to provide super quality produce for people, that's even harder. And so the concept of me growing my farm, there's limitations. But like, you know, I I love that you also do that where you're like, well, hey, I'm going to grow what I like to grow. I'm going to grow what I'm good at. I'm going to grow what works for me. And then I'm going to source some other farms. And I like that model because I don't see the CSA as a charity. It's a give and a take. There's reciprocity. They trust you. They become your CSA member. You have the, That's your responsibility to give back. And, and by including other farms, that makes that way more achievable. What if I have a crop failure? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and people are like, what do you mean you don't have tomato? <laughs> yeah. Like, what? Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, and, exactly. And I also, I hedge a little bit because there's things that maybe, maybe the farm you're working with, maybe they usually do that item, but what if they have a crop failure? So, you know, maybe you're relying on them for that crop, but maybe you grow some of it just to, just to be safe and, and make sure your CSA members have it, you know? And I, I also feel that we have tons of really unique microclimates, like most regions do. And if you can really leverage those microclimates, you can really get early, late production of all different types of items and really fill that CSA uh, out even better. Yeah. And it's exciting. It's exciting. You know, and then also we eat the items, yeah. you know, so like I'm getting Brussels sprouts from Sensori Farm right now. Well, we're loving these Brussels sprouts. I'm not growing Brussels sprouts, you know? Totally. Yeah. It, and I feel like it removes some of that pressure and also some of that anxiety. Granted, you have to budget out for it and it takes a little bit of planning. But I feel like when I have that in my back pocket, of like, oh, at any moment, if something fails or something was wrong, I can lean on my community of growers uh, and still supply this product instead of, I don't know, maybe an older mentality of, well, if it's not from you know, at, it's not from Country Valley, then it's not coming off this far or it's not going in this box. Uh, if- yeah, that, that man, I agree with you 100%. That, that is the saving grace. We have enough pressure. We need, yeah. and there's some things we can't solve for, but we can solve for sourcing Yeah, uh, in many cases. Yeah. And, and even beyond uh, a business interaction, I also find that uh, you know, farmers working together in sales. It's also just for, for, for mental health, just the connection of growers in the middle of the season to talk about ideas or even just to be seen by somebody else. Because uh, I know many growers who maybe, maybe don't have families or farm alone or farm with a very small crew. And it can be hard to really reach out and interact with people in your community, especially, you know, in July when they're super hot and, you know, tomatoes need to be harvested. Absolutely. Um, so uh, I think we're going to uh, just wrap this up. Uh, I have. To our two our final questions uh so the first one is uh kind of a two-parter what was a major success of your farm and what was another moment that you were just like man i'm done with this i'm i think we're at the rock bottom i would say our major success uh one would be garlic like like when we first started farming here i said i think i'm gonna far- focus on garlic I think it suits our model. It suits our limitations. I don't have a walk-in cooler. Yeah. You know, it, it, it suits. I know how to grow garlic. I've done it before. I believe in it. It's it's one that grows with you. So we started by buying 100 pounds of seed garlic from another farm. 
and and it saved seed every year. And the and the success of that was growing garlic where people said, This is good garlic. Your garlic tastes different. It mm. tastes good. And then finding that other local farms want to buy our garlic for their farm stand, for their farmers market booth, for their CSA, and for planting. And that is very rewarding. And I would say that's the big victory. Um in terms of like failure or big bummer, when um if you have a life problem that comes up, health, family, that makes it very difficult when you're the tractor for your farm. You're the, you know, you're filling 12 jobs on the farm and then you're impacted. That that we've had some of that and that um, that is very challenging but it's something you pick yourself up from. Yeah. Um, and, and then other than that, just the darn animals, like where, <laughs> where they come eat literally thousands of dollars of the food. Yeah. And it's hard too. Like, like you pay a lot of money on those transplants. You've put the furrow, put the compost, the manure, you've been babying them for such a long time. And then even though it, everyone has to eat, but if they're coming out of nowhere and take that last little, little morsel out of your mouth, it just feels so personal. Yeah. And it's discouraging. It's very discouraging because it's like, what are we going to do? And it's like, well, try again. Yeah. And I, I feel that's the farmer mentality, right? We just we go, it's, it's next week. It's next, it's next season. It's just, okay, we'll pick, pick, pick it up and just you know, focus up and get ready for the next season. That's all we really can't, that's all we really have. That's all we can do. And when I look to older farmers or uh, other farmers that I say, oh, they're a good example, that positive mental attitude, mm. that never giving up, that taking it in stride, that, you know, that having hope, but, but not attaching the expectation. Those are the gems of wisdom. You know, it's all about how you feel. Yeah. It's all about how you think about what you're doing. And you, if you connect it to something positive, which I know you and I, that's both of us are trying to do positive work for the community and for the planet. When you're connected to that, that gives you strength mm. that gives you energy you know you're you're an instrument of that you're an extension of that and so in a way you're kind of bulletproof to some of that stuff it's all you know i, I like the bruce lee mentality of mind like water that, that's one that i follow and um yeah that kind of stuff yeah I, and i feel like you know there's all this joy and all this love of being on the earth and when we are able to, let's say, at the farmers market or our CSA members, not only share them that share them that produce, but when they see the joy that comes along with, uh, the, the, with, with 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 farming, but or with just being on the land, it helps radiate onto them. So I feel like we're part of our, that part of the community as well, just sh- spreading the happiness, not only through food, but just you know the upliftingness that, that that's been placed on us from uh, you know being on the farm. Yes, yes, and that. And you get to share that with them. And, and it's, it's, there's an exchange. Yes. And, and it's, you know, no matter what's going on in the world, we can still celebrate good food. Man, that's, that's it right there. Last thing we're going to round this out in, uh, kind of asked it already, or answered it already, but how do you find balance and working the farm and taking care of yourself? How, how do you do that? Well, I need to improve on it. Um, But I've learned, you know, I've learned that you need to make time for life stuff. And so you need to mentally, emotionally decouple. So you might have a plan for, okay, on Thursday, I'm going to do this. But then you have a family event Mm. on Thursday. And you might say, I can't go to the family event. I have to do this. And it's like, no, no, you have to create some space. And and there's an acknowledgement like, you could work 24 seven on the farm and still not get everything done. And so I think, you know, the que- the answer is in the question, like you have to create the space. Yeah. Great word. Adam, thank you so much for taking your time out of your busy farm day to come chat with me. Uh, your words meant a lot to me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alex. It was awesome spending the time with you and, and an honor to be here with you. A big thanks to Adam for sitting down and sharing all the work he and his family are doing over there at Country Valley Farm. He's such a love for not only ecological farming, but for feeding his community and share the positivity that comes with being in touch with the land. I was really impressed by his deep wood chip compost method for building organic matter. I think I'm going to try it on my farm this year just to see how it works out. 
If you want to learn more about the farm or just looking for organic seed dialect, check out their websites and social media for more information. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, have a great day. Hey, you all, Farmer Jesse here, just jumping in real quick to catch you up on some of what we have going on. We, that is Jackson, myself, and Clara Coleman, just got back from a little no-till growers family trip over to the Virginia Biological Farmers Conference in Roanoke, Virginia, and that was really great. Huge shout out to the VABF for putting on such a great event. Uh, We plan to take the crew to a conference every year if we can, just to attend and hang out. So we'll be on the lookout for another great conference next year. Speaking of conferences, if you are still deciding on what conference to attend yourself this year, might I recommend the Organic Association of Kentucky Conference, also known as Oak, in late January, the 26th through the 28th, 2023. No-till growers will have a booth there, so come say hi. Have you checked out the new No-Till Growers Forum yet? It is awesome. You can find the forum at notillgrowers.com. We will also put a link in the show notes. Also, like everything we do, the forum is free and open to the public. If you'd like to support our work, you can pick up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook at notillgrowers.com or one of the No-Till hats, which are back in stock. The proceeds from those sales at notillgrowers.com go to making you more content. Or lastly, you can always become a Patreon member at patreon.com slash no-till growers, where not only may you get discounts on our stuff, but at a certain level, or if you just bump up from one level to another, you get a shout out on the show. So big shout outs this week to Bill Altman and Stephen Smith. Huge shout out to everyone who supports our show in whatever way that you can. The Patreon page is the lifeblood of our work, so we hope you will hop on board. And that's it for me. Thanks, you all. We'll see you next week. Bye.